To start us off today, we have a very, very special treat. Um, we have the privilege of being joined by Karen DeSalvo, uh, who is um, an individual who brings really unparalleled uh, experience, insight, uh, passion, and leadership to a, a, the full range of the issues that we discussed uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, Karen uh, has provided leadership in medicine and public health and information technology and health equity, all of these repeated themes. Uh, and not only has she provided leadership, but she's really been uh, at the forefront, at the, at the tip of the spear on these issues uh, at the national level. So to complement what we heard yesterday from Secretary Cohn, uh, we're going to he hear a national perspective uh, from uh, Dr. DeSalvo. And let me just tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she's currently a professor of uh, medicine and population health at the University of Texas uh, Dell Medical School at Austin. Uh, and she's also a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, and she's on her way uh, in just a week or so uh, to uh, Google, where she's the chief, going to be the chief health officer uh, for Google. And so we're, and, uh, we're all very, very fortunate that they have uh, made that decision. Uh, but let me tell you a little more about uh, Karen. Uh, uh, in, um, in the Obama administration, uh, Karen served as Assistant Secretary for Health, which is head of the Public Health Service, the, the health side of the programs. So she obviously worked closely on the health financing side with uh, Secretary Cohn. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a, a really a, a, a privilege for us all to have that dynamic duo with us here today uh, to identify our opportunities. Uh, prior to, uh, uh, to her position as, as Assistant Secretary for Health, she was the IT czar for the nation, the director of the Office of Health Information Technology. And the reason that she was tapped, or one of the reasons, she may tell you uh, what the real reason was uh, for that uh, position, is that before uh, she came to the federal government, uh, she was the uh, Commissioner of Health for the City of New Orleans. And she was instrumental uh, to efforts uh, to restore health uh, after the devastation of Katrina and relied not only on her activation of community forces uh, and, and leadership, but on the use of IT uh, to help jumpstart the progress uh, in, uh, in rebuilding the health, uh, uh, the health sector uh, throughout New Orleans. Um, before that, um, she uh, actually, I should say that she also has uh, a deep um, uh, reservoir of experience in academia. Uh, actually, her time here at UT Austin is uh, is a, a passing uh, element, but prior to that, she was at Tulane, uh, where she was uh, vice dean for community health affairs and health policy at the Tulane School of Medicine and chief of general internal medicine and geriatrics. So we have with us here today someone who is an extraordinary talent. She's also, in addition to her um, her day jobs with uh, in medical school and uh, uh, and um, uh, with the Bipartisan Policy Center. She's co-convener of the National Alliance to Impact the Social Determinants of Health. She serves as the director on the boards of Humana and Welltower. She's a member of the Verily uh, Life Sciences Advisory Board. She's a commissioner on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. Uh, and she's the current president of the Society of General Internal Medicine and the honorary vice president for the United States of, for the American Public Health Association. Uh, she um, earned her MD and MPH from Tulane University and her master's uh, from Harvard uh, University. Karen DeSalvo, thank you very much.
Thank you. <laughs> We're going to have an informal conversation. Who needs a mother when you have a guy like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually could have gone on for a lot longer. And maybe after the session I will. <laughs> How are you all doing? Good morning. Howdy. <laughs> well, welcome, Karen. Uh, we obviously are delighted uh, uh, and very grateful for your being here with us. Um, this is a conversation. It could be very wide-ranging, given Karen's uh, wide-ranging experience and expertise. But we're going to start uh, with a focus on uh, a theme that has coursed throughout much of our conversation, and that is social circumstances and the way social circumstances uh, shape our health uh, prospects, and more importantly, in many ways, um, the, um, at least by example of stark contrast, the way we, uh, how we have come to be um, in the international community, such outliers uh, in the health arena. When uh, you, you all know the figures, you saw them yesterday, uh, Despite spending 50% more than the, our closest second spender, uh, we are ranking somewhere in the 30s with respect to overall health performance. And when you look at that performance in terms of returns on investment, it's not just poor performance, it's disastrous, uh, given the amount of money that we, uh, uh, that we spend. So it would be, uh, I think, very helpful um, uh -oh. That doesn't matter. <laughs> Karen. Shave, shave yeah. 10 minutes off the. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. <laughs> Thank you. To Chief start President. off uh, with this right here, uh, which is an, uh, an Academy's report, the consensus, consensus study report on integrating social care into the delivery of health care, moving upstream to improve the nation's health. Uh, Karen, you were on this panel, uh, and this is a—it's issued a f vitally important uh, set of determinations and recommendations for us as a nation. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the high-level recommendations of the report? Um, I will. I, let me let me start by saying thanks for uh, inviting me and having me here. And I'm uh, a, f a fan girl of Ma of Mandy's, have been uh, since I first uh, met her, and. Um, there is an extraordinary team of talent in this state, so you're at a unique moment in time. And, and I know you know this, but the world really is watching, and I want you to feel a lot of pressure because you need to get some stuff done um, so that others will feel empowered to go forward and that, that um, we can really learn from from what you're doing. I think one of the most, there, we can talk more later about the way that I think you've structured things and I hope that we'll get a chance to, but it's not just the what you're doing, it's the how. And so there, there's a lot to be learned of, of how um, the team has been uh, organized, how you're taking the best of the best from across the country and not feeling that you need to reinvent everything, but you want to assemble a, a, a strong strategy. Um, you know, my, my, um, my experience with the social determinants of health, like many primary care docs, happened over and over at the bedside or in the exam room. And usually it was, please don't tell me that you've got, <laughs> you know, whatever, food insecurity, um, a challenge, because I just don't know what to do with it. And um, that's happening just as we speak all across the country. There are doctors and other clinicians that are that are worried that something's going the conversation's going to go beyond medical but what you do know is that it has to or, or you can't really get to the root of the challenges that that folks face and um, we we saw that really clearly uh, um, after Hurricane Katrina as we were re rebuilding the health care system because just like the country's journey when we looked at our stats in Louisiana and we said well let's not rebuild what we had because the system was designed to create the highest cost and worst quality in the country and some of the worst overall health outcomes. Let's redo the healthcare system when we have this opportunity and, you know, base it on primary care and digitize it and focus on quality and uh, many of the things the country's been doing, right? Um, but we did that locally 
it became very clear very quickly, though, for some very visual reasons. Uh, the entire community was destroyed. We lost 250,000 houses. 80% of our community was underwater for at least 30 days. And uh, people didn't have schools and uh, jobs and bus lines and anything to get to get their work done. And it was when people came to clinic, yes, they were concerned about their diabetes, but they were much more concerned about when will the schools open or when will we have electricity back in this neighborhood. They were telling us every minute of every day um, in a flood that you couldn't avoid, that the, that the non-medical drivers were more important to them. And so we began to build that into our clinical systems. But for me personally and many others, it became really clear that the bigger and more significant statistic to track on was the 25-year gap in life expectancy we had in New Orleans based upon where people lived. Like a whole generation, like literally a whole generation of difference based upon what's about a four-mile difference. And, you know, I'd been practicing medicine for 15 years, thought I was all knowledgeable about community health, like part of community. I had no flippin' idea what was really going on when I stepped out of my box of medicine. And the storm also caused us to have to step out of our box and be in community, talking to people, hearing from them, and shaping not just the healthcare system, but then public health. Our journey, um, as I've learned over the course of time, has been happening in communities all across the country. And I think the, the, the grass tops of the world picked up on this in the last few years. Some of us have been pushing the agenda, so we're happy the grass tops have been thinking more about this as an opportunity, again, to not only do things like drive down cost and improve outcomes of, of health care, but really genuinely improve health. Thing, big public health indicators like maternal mortality or life expectancy or, frankly, just quality of life and well-being. So the, the National Academy's uh, uh, interest in this space, which is deeper than the last couple of years, but I think is really importantly ramped up, I think is a wonderful signal that the most important institutions in our country are recognizing that health is more than health care and that there needs to be not only action on the front lines, but supportive building of an evidence base for policy and action and a policy basis that can support what's happening um, on the ground. And so this uh, opportunity uh, of one of what's a, uh, there are a, now a couple of other reports that this builds on and there will hopefully be more from the academy is about integrating social care into the delivery of health care uh, we were charged, um, Betsy was on this, and Chris, uh, who was here yesterday, was also on this group. We were charged by the, um, the uh, resources given to the committee to talk to the medical community about what they, they could and should do around understanding social drivers in the, either the context of health care or the context of populations and communities they serve. So I just want to very clearly stipulate that. We all struggled with this because we're, we're all of a mind that let's go upstream, let's go upstream. We need to do more to change context, but really where we were charged is to, to focus on what the health care system and, and cl clinicians could do. So the, re the recommendations in the report are, are in that vein of moving medicine upstream. Uh, we, we tried to um, get a frame on what is all, there was so much activity happening in the, on the front lines, some of it in the peer-reviewed literature, some of it published so that it could be, you know, assessed and evaluated and said, yes, this actually is a good approach or, uh, to, to anything we want to do. A lot of the work happening in social determinants, especially related to the healthcare system, is in the gray literature or on someone's website about how wonderful they are. And so hard to know if we can believe it, right? And um, the, so, so the committee tried to cast a broad net to look for promising practices. You all will not su be surprised that North Carolina is in there. Uh, it's particularly in the data and tech chapter, uh, talking about NC Cares 360. But um, there we, we, we have other models uh, in the public and private sector and tried to shape those into these five A's. Um, you know, first, uh, uh, they're not necessarily in a continuum, so I don't want to say it that way, but I, my experience with health systems is that this kind of is the continuum, that first they become aware, they have to assess the need of not only a person or a population or a community, um, and then they begin to, to think that they might need to accommodate in some fashion. Um, so if, if there's a lot of, of transportation issues in a community, should we be doing more telehealth or you know, going out to community or not requiring people to, to come into us as much. The third is, is helping to fill some of those social needs or address some social goals um, 
for individuals in particular, but um, thinking about, for example, providing rideshare or vouchers for taxis for transportation. The fourth area is about aligning, and um, this is really when we start to move more and more. The team part is in the assistance in particular, maybe all those first three, but you start to really think about community when you talk about alignment and advocacy. So um, how does the health system, healthcare system um, align with other sectors, food sector, housing, public health, um, to, to begin to understand where there, what are the assets in a community, and I use that term as broadly as possible, and where there are gaps, and, and how can they work together to, to fill those. And the final area is about advocacy, which is um, not just, for example, um, say you run to assist somebody with transportation so you give them a rideshare coupon or you want to align the transportation align with the transportation services in the community and start to um, put put um, health centers on a map of the bus routes but rather start to add um, bus stops or other public transportation as an example there could be other options to really change the fabric of a community and some organizations like Kaiser Permanente are further along in that journey. Um, Bernard Tyson and other leaders in that organization, I think, have really, they, they move very swiftly from, okay, we know there's a challenge, we're trying to help individuals, but really there's more we could do with our organizational heft as healthcare to advocate for better public, better, better public transportation, better housing, living wage, these really structural, um, contextual changes that are going to make a difference over time. So the five A's really are just designed to give organizations and communities a, a, a way to anchor what the healthcare system might do. And we have a set of, of recommendations in, in big areas around workforce, um, digital and technology, and financing that are um, pointed largely at the public space, but there are quite a lot that the private sector can do, um, and uh, some of those efforts are uh, either underway or we have good hope that they might be helpful, and we might talk about some of those later, but the, um, I, I do hope that you all will take a look at the report, not only because of the opportunity to help frame as you're talking to healthcare systems and, and to health plans, like this is the sort of five A's ways to think about it, or to individual clinicians, but also to think about what are the changes that need to happen with respect to the way we do business as healthcare. Again, I'm, the report is designed to talk to healthcare. That's not, we don't believe that's the whole be all and end all, but it's the, um, it, it, the academy uh, was charged with beginning to have that conversation to help medicine, move medicine upstream. Thank you, Karen. Um, it was a really wonderful uh, overview uh, from a very practical ground level perspective of uh, the issues and opportunities. Um, Two or three things uh, prompted in listening to you. Uh, one observation and two questions. The observation was that we really lost a very important ally uh, when Bernard Tyson passed away a couple of weeks ago because what Kaiser's been doing has been extraordinary. Um, uh, one of the questions um, uh, picks up on the notion of what's required in the way of linkages with other uh, sectors uh, in, in engagement. And so I'd like to come back to the question of how do we play out, identify, uh, and cultivate those partnerships. But first, um, I, I want to pick up uh, on a self-centered perspective, and that is ask you what you think the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academies, uh, might be doing uh, to help advance the evidence base uh, in order to uh, mobilize and, and provide resources to um, and, uh, and, and prompt the kind of activity uh, that you see as necessary and that you, in the course of your committee work and elsewhere, beyond the notion of just health care and the linkage between health care and community, what is it that the National Academies ought to be doing uh, or has the opportunity to do in order to help move the frontier. I'll answer that if you promise me we'll get back to other sectors. Yes. Okay. So, um, short of changing the name of the academy to the National Academy of Health, but <laughs> we, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm personally very concerned about the squishiness of the evidence in this, in this space. So that's one, one area. I mean, um, and what I mean by that is, 
if we proceed with with the speed the country's going to to um, develop policy based upon pilots and ideas and don't have a stronger evidence based about what we can expect would be the return for that for health or for cost we're, we might wake up in five years and um, think that we went through this interesting fad that didn't of addressing social determinants of health it didn't make a difference at all so pff, forget that and move on and that would be terrible for what we need to do for the health of this country um, uh, on the other hand, um, if we're more intentional about uh, making certain that we're having a con uh, harmonized way of, of evaluating and measuring impact of whatever is happening on the front lines and taking advantage of, of uh, different kinds of methodologies than randomized control trials, for example, but using, um, taking advantage of implementation and embedded science. Um, using synthetic populations to understand what the impact of, of policies might be at the institutional or at the uh, community level. We, um, we would, I think, get, have more speed in the work and we take advantage of the experiments happening on the front lines, but there would be some methodologic rigor and, and analysis and evaluation associated with that. Uh, this, this could be uh, stepped up and funded more through federal uh, groups like NIH or ARC. PCORI is another resource for that. Uh, but also um, institutions, centers of excellence could be funded to do this kind of work in the way that we did with the HIV epidemic. We set up um, a network of uh, AIDS clinical trial units and said we need to have the best science that needs to happen on the front lines and we need it really quickly because people are dying. And people are dying from the social determinants of health. They're killing themselves, they're drinking themselves to death, they're overdosing, um, they're, um, those are, those deaths of despair are related to underlying issues around racism, economic, lack of economic opportunity, social isolation. I mean, the data, the data seems to point in that direction, right? So if, that, if HIV was a significant epidemic and we applied scientific rigor with do, all due haste across the country, we should be doing the same thing around the social determinants and not relying on frontline uh, projects uh, to, to do this. We need to be um, more systematic. But I, I want to say this sort of two other things about the science. Um, so the academy could help by calling for and frankly helping to shape out a, a scientific agenda and a strategy and, and getting the attention of um, the key leaders who could provide the funding but also help develop the talent that can do that kind of work because not everybody is trained with that kind of research skill. The second piece is that this is uh, interprofessional work and if we rely solely on the the House of Medicine to understand the outcomes, we're going to end up looking at outcomes that benefit the House of Medicine. And um, we need to be in, in, including social scientists and others in this work. Um, this is much more complex. This is a new field. This is a new thing that we're creating. And we just haven't articulated what it is. And I think the Academy could be very helpful to understand what's going to be the, the best science in the area. And the third thing I, I, I want to say about the science is maybe even more worrisome to me than not than having bad science that doesn't give that that we th build policy on that then falls flat is that we think that um, the good science of a randomized control trial of addressing food insecurity for duly eligible populations post discharge and we show that you can reduce uh, hospitalizations by whatever they showed, 23%. I don't, know Seth, I don't know if Seth's in the room, but he's in North Carolina, so I'm picking on his science. Um, Seth Berkowitz, outstanding scientist. Uh, on the other hand, if, if, you, if, we, if you present that kind of data to policymakers, their inclination is to say, oh, great, we're going to add to the fee schedule, asking about food insecurity and, and pay for addressing it through, through payer programs. And then when, and we're going to create some measures that will show that that improved and we're going to check that box and we have dealt with the social determinants of health. And I was, uh, maybe at dinner, I remember when I was sharing the story about my, my grandmother-in-law. Was I telling you about that? And, and I don't, I, please forgive me, for this, I don't mean to be glib about this, but I, I think she's such a, I think about her a lot. Um, but I also think about this example of if you asked Mana, are you food insecure? And so then, like, think about this, like her doctor asks that, checks a box, and then they send her some, some food. She would say yes, but she has enough food to last through the apocalypse in her house. <laughs> like, she has more canned soup than the grocery store has. And, but she is food insecure because she's lonely and she can't drive anymore, and so she might need something at the grocery. She, 
you know, uh, all the other reasons, right? And, and, and we all know this from the people and communities we talk to. People don't have one social determinant or social driver. These things, this is bundled stuff. This is generational issues that are contextual and, and not just about the person, but it's also about where they live. So the complexity of the science, this gets back to that middle bucket of it being interprofessional, is um, going to require um, ethics and other kinds of thinking. But also, I think I don't want us to go down a pathway of creating crisp, clear, randomized trials that draw the attention of actuaries and policymakers to think if we solve these one or two things, we've kind of done our job. Well, and the data infrastructure that's being developed here is part of the uh, secretaries and the, and the health director's uh, initiative is going to be helpful in uh, advancing that embedded science uh, that, uh, that you've identified. Uh, we will take th those suggestions on what we should do to heart, and uh, I'm confident that I can speak uh, for Vic Victor and myself that uh, we'll give a, a stronger uh, measure of attention. Uh, certainly the strongest we can to advancing that science base. Uh, back to the... Uh, can, I, can I say one, one thing about that? Um, just in case um, Francis Collins is watching. Um, the, you know, back to the House of Medicine. Um, when the NIH says go left, every academic medical center in the country goes left. And what that means is that uh, not only the scientific pillar of, of the training, I'm, I'm going to be very doctor focused, but this, hap this is true for nursing, um, is it also begins to influence what the students are exposed to. And so the teaching enterprise and the clinical enterprise are affected. It's really powerful. It, that's a very powerful tool in the toolbox of elevating the, the respect and appreciation and the credibility of the social determinants of health. So part of it is the funding and the building of a new enterprise, but it's also just to have the scientific community, like the academy, say, this is real. This is not fuzzy stuff. There's actual data that shows that the social determinants of health affect your biology, right, and, and your physiology, so that it's, th there's, there's a grounding, and, and it, this is not fluffy qualitative research. And, and so hopefully Francis will continue to lean in, and, and I, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but he's a very credible, uh, you know, leader, and, and we need folks like that, like the Academy, to, to do just what you're doing and step up and say, this is really important for the health of the country. We need to do all the other work we're doing to build better drugs or better pathways, better payment models, but we also need to understand that there's more to health and healthcare. Well said. Signals matter in a very big way, and we need to take full advantage of that. So, as I promised, back to partnerships. Um, health improvement is a collaborative enterprise. How do we in the health sector ensure that we are identifying and collaborating uh, in a truly purposeful way uh, to make the changes necessary? Yeah, you know, um, I worked my way through college working at the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. So I, and then I went, got a degree in public health when I was getting my MD. And so you'd think I would have been better at, the, better at understanding the powerful importance of public health to start there as a partner. But when, when I, um, um, it took me more time than I care to admit to recognize that we weren't going to solve this just out of health care, this being our challenges in Louisiana, and that's going to be the same for the country. That that um, it was that sort of Galileo Copernicus moment, like the, like healthcare is not the center of the universe, um, that there's actually something else that is, it's called the person in the community, and that maybe we're not, we can go as far as we can, but we've got to meet some other sectors uh, on the other side. And public health is a partner we had pretty tightly bound to medicine for a lot of years until um, the, through good intention, um, but I think over the course of generations, those two fields have split off and have different language and professional tracks and accreditation and different rooms in which they work. And resources. And res uh, very different resources. And it's just, um, it's, it's, I think it's really hurting the country. We've done it, we've disarticulated that in, the, in governmental processes, and I, by the way, think that is part of the secret sauce of, um, of North Carolina is the vision to have somebody like Betsy, who's deeply experienced in public health, also be um, uh, part of leading the, the Medicaid program. And 
bridging those worlds to think about Medicaid as a tool to improve health broadly, not just as a way to reimburse providers for services that they deliver. I hope that this kind of example, um, we, we stop disarticulating public health from various other really important health drivers. I mean, we've even done that with environmental health. And at the, the all across the country, your preparedness now is sort of separate and apart. And it really worries me that we're not in the same rooms, working together for the same for the same shared goals. So, a part of this this um, change that I think we're going to have to do not only in the research strata but also in the work strata is to bring the f do a forcing function to bring the fields together at the uh, policy and the practice the practice level. You know, when I went. I became health commissioner, and um, I, like, I didn't want to do it. It was like nine months of talking to Mitch Landry. I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find you somebody to do that. I want to be health commissioner. I was, all, I, you know, and I, I talk about my, I talk about that woman. I don't know who she was, but she thought she was so important. She was at the, you know, the, the academic medical school, and she was a vice dean. She wasn't going to be a health commissioner of the city or whatever, but she was going to find someone to go do that. And I went down the street. Two, two blocks from my office to City Hall, and I mean, I still get goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. I thought, what has been going on in my head? Like, I had no idea that there was this powerful, brilliant workforce of people who had spent years understanding the community, being on the front lines, doing this incredibly important work, who were this resource that we didn't even think about, right, in, in the academic environment. And that we, I be, we look down on them. I'm, I'm just flat out saying that. Like we thought, well, they're just, that's public health. We'll deal with them later. They were so skilled and, and needed resources, needed to be modernized, wanted it badly, were hungry to be a part of the, to be at the table and lead at the table. Uh, it was a, uh, if anyone has ever has the opportunity, particularly to work in local public health, even if it's a short tour of duty, it's just I think should be required for everybody in medicine because you just you, you don't see how valuable that partnership can be. So I had that very, <laughs> I had this very like visceral uh, experience, and and it has forever changed uh, the way I see that part of the world. But I also learned a lot about the social care sector. I'm still learning about it, um, and it, it, it uh, I particularly learned about it because we were running WIC programs, a program I didn't even know about because I was an internist, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassing myself, I, I guess, for perpetuity, but it's just the truth. I, 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 there's a lot that medicine has to learn about who our partners can be, so that's sort of step one. Um, I think step two was I couldn't believe how poorly resourced they were. I was the chief of general internal medicine, and we're like the, we are the poor, except for family medicine, we're the we're the, the least resourced um, <laughs> with all uh, in the in the in the school yeah school of medicine. But but we I mean we we couldn't afford coffee cups if we wanted to have a community meeting. We're like paying for that out of pocket. We had no budget for stuff like that. And that's not New Orleans. That's what's happening all in this country to one of the most important partners who, by the way, is not just skilled and experienced and in touch with the community in a way that medicine can, in my opinion, not be because the agenda for public health is about health and not about sickness. And medicine, as hard as you try here in North Carolina, you're still on the backbone of a, of a chassis that is about we're gonna find sick people and do stuff to them. But public health has a completely different frame and is statutorily accountable for the health of everybody in the community, everyone who lives, learns, works, and plays there, and there's no other entity that doesn't do that because it's a fad or because it looks good to do this because the cool kids are doing it. Public health gets up or does this 24-7, and so we need to not only recognize and welcome them and have them at the table or leading at the table and be as structural in our thinking about how to include them, not just a handshake, but really create structure, but we need to resource them. And I'm not going to go on a tangent about it. I have written about it if anyone's interested in the American Journal of Public Health. We published a paper this last September talking about public health infrastructure financing. That's important. But the social care sector also, and I'm using that term, uh, it's a very broad term. I think the housing sector is doing a super smart job of creating public-private partnerships and being m more um, sophisticated about financing models than other sectors are yet. But the social, broadly, the social services providers and the social care sector are um, 
less resourced than public health. And I, I just, I, I, I don't even know how that could happen in this country, considering how important it is. And um, it's, it's a real strain. So we, as we go on this journey, and we want to, and we are reaching out to the social care sector, we as a country, we're crushing them already. And um, I think there was some conversation about that yesterday. I'm, I'm hearing a lot about that um, in the field, that, um, that already organizations that are, uh, health care systems in particular, that are further on the value-based care journey, that are in those downside risk models that cause them to want to have these more structured, aligned relationships with the uh, social care partners. They're running out of, the social care partners are overwhelmed. There's, there's long lists and queues. They're learning how to pick, and, the social care providers are learning how to pick and choose the less needy folks that are coming to them since they're getting kind of paid a flat rate and they, they as a mom and pop soft money housing support agency don't want all the super sick people with behavioral health disorders. They're trying to balance their books. Um, and they don't have good digital infrastructure, et cetera. So there's a lot of, of need to really uh, assess that space and to, to quantify the need and then find a way to provide resources um, and modernize it, uh, I think, is the, uh, is the other piece. So there's some interesting work, like Len Nichols and Lauren Taylor um, uh, wrote a piece about this. And I, I, I mentioned uh, a, a manuscript, not be, because sometimes manuscripts do change the world. And this is one in which um, a really thoughtful economist is talking about new ways of, of particularly <laughs> local uh, private sector engagement to share in the gains, uh, to pool resources to address um, social determinants of health uh, for individuals, but maybe it's a bridge towards further upstream work. And um, the, there, but there are others. Stuart Butler has written about this, a very conservative economist. And so back to this sort of, you know, the grass tops national landscape, folks who spent a lot of their brain injury on health care, brain injury. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Um, so, brilliant, brilliant people like Mark McClellan, um, or Stuart Butler and Len Nichols, who are, are very uh, uh, well-respected uh, economists who have been thinking a lot about health care policy or starting to think about health policy more broadly and social determinants. This is a wonderful turn of the tide. It's the step towards getting the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget to really begin to think from an economics and actuarial basis about helping more than health care. What are the other component partners and what kind of resources do they have and, and might they need? I can't believe it. I've just gotten the sign that we're running out of time. But uh, <laughs> because uh, I, for one, would like to sit here for the next three or four hours and uh, talk with Karen. But uh, let me ask you just two more questions. Um, I'll try to be really fast, Jessica. Yes, and, and short answers. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, not my best skill. Yeah. Question one. You were a very senior uh, official in the Obama administration. Um, and uh, y you obviously um, have uh, inspired ideas about things that could happen across the board uh, to uh, uh, yield a healthier nation. If you were not Assistant Secretary for Health, but you were President uh, of, uh, of the United States, and you had to balance everything, you know, <laughs> right? If there was a write-in, uh, year all the family medicine doctors are like, yes, yeah. <laughs> a write-in a year from now, and lo and behold, President DeSalvo uh, is here. But you have to balance all these competing priorities. Uh, what would you do? What would be the single most important thing you think you could do uh, to advance progress uh, in the health of the nation by engaging? the social circumstances that people face? How would you help people at the state and local level through federal policies? And now I have one minute for that? <laughs> yeah. That was not on the list um, of questions. I, I, so, I, somebody once said, uh, uh, put this kind of challenge to me saying, you know, yeah. you are going to go to the White House and yeah. you've got one chance in an elevator yeah. ride to think about what you're going to say. Uh, you know, um, let me, let me just start by saying that while um, I was uh, in, the, in the Obama administration, there was a lot of groundwork being laid um, to uh, spread the notion that there's more to health and health care. And 
uh, people like Rahul and Mandy and um, Patrick and others um, were working on accountable health communities models and m Medicaid programs in New York and Oregon and other states were already underway. So folks were thinking about it. We had Public Health 3.0, which was uh, a call to arms for the, the public health community to address the social determinants of health, which is a report uh, that my office put out. And even in the technology space, we rewrote the strategic plan and included in it a pathway to a digital world that could address the social determinants of health. We, so, so the groundwork was there, and I think this is an important um, takeaway, is that states can innovate because you're, you're, you have a rapid cycle of change. It's proximate, and you have uh, local health plans and um, local public health and local uh, philanthropy that, that allows you to do fast work, but the federal government has a longer arc. But I think the... Um, uh, I guess I'm going to say a couple things, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to be political, but I think the first thing that is, I'm going to say is um, more in the healthcare space. I would just like to just stop talking about coverage expansion. I want it to happen so that everybody has access to affordable health insurance. Can we just clap for that? Yes, including in North Carolina. Because it sucks the policy oxygen out of the room, and there's no space to talk about the other important things that we need to do to actually get to health. I also think that um, uh, we need to marshal the Office of Management and Budget, which I, I believe could be a much more powerful resource at understanding the assets that we already have that can drive health, being selfish here, but health as a pathway to well-being and economic prosperity, and um, begin to really truly evaluate the, the benefit out of those programs and be as clear as possible within and figure out how far we can go within statutory authority and then what Congress needs to do to help to allow us to pool resources on the front lines. Um, I think I, I, the, the, the siloing of not just data but, but of money and of personnel, when you are working on the front lines, it's a ridiculous morass to get through. And what people need is as much flexibility as possible within current um, and they need clarity through clear guidelines. And it needs to come from the White House, not just from HHS, because uh, y there are important opportunities in labor and housing and commerce and USDA and other departments. So this isn't just about what the health secretary can do. It is actually it's something that the White House can do. And the reason I go to OMB is because they know where everything is and they know what all the rules are and they can bend them or decide where we need to go to Congress to get changes. But I, I actually, so, so maybe to say it more simply, I think we've got a significant structural problem in the country and I've said that in different ways. The structural problems are that we keep separating things into different rooms and I wouldn't want social determinants to be separated into a different agency or department. I would just want the, the, all of the potential opportunities that we have to drive health. Maybe I'll just say one more thing because I know you care a lot about this. Um, and this, this is a kind of a, well, I mean, a, a health thing um, is we actually, um, this may so surprise some of you all if you haven't been in federal government, but the president or the secretary doesn't have a dashboard of health for the country that's near term. So the secretary doesn't find out till a couple of years later um, how folks are doing, and it's uh, terrible. And uh, in, in in Cuba, the minister of health finds out every morning what happened the day before, the day before, and there's an action plan to make change. A model like that we ought to with sophistication be able to do here. And the reason I mentioned that, it's another structural issue. We're, we're looking in the rearview mirror all the time, and we don't have any even, we, don't, we can't forecast and we can't now cast. And we have to do a better job of that as a country so that we can, we can um, get ahead of things like an opioid epidemic or whatever's um, about to come next. And I know that I'm done, but can I just say one more little thing? Done. Oh, okay, you have one more final question? All right. I have one more thing I want to say. Whatever the question Sorry, is, I'm gonna Jessica. say this. <laughs> Last question, but I know, she, I know she can't go on too long about this because we've asked her to reflect on all the national policy issues which she obviously lives and breathes. She's about in two weeks to be living and breathing the digital uh, private sector uh, world. Uh, and uh, you're not at Google yet, but you will be, and I know you can't say a lot about what you're gonna do with specificity, but you can reflect uh, briefly on what you think uh, the digital world can do to help change the dynamics we see in the social determinants of health. Okay, well this is good because I can still say what I wanted to say, which is, and that's probably good mission alignment for me, um, that I'm taking a job where it allows what I think is probably the most important. Um, technology and data and analytics are a tool that will give us 
um, more time and space and emotional um, depth, or not depth, emo- emotional um, energy to, to think about and treat people like human beings. And it's not a substitute for that work, but absent really understanding context, and that's a place where data can be helpful, understanding trajectory, that's a place analytics can be helpful, and technology to help meet people and communities where they are. Um, we, we're, I think we're too busy um, trying to deal with all that cognitive burden, and if we can reduce that through some augmentation and also use it to better communicate, I think we can get back to what's fundamental in all this. This is not, I mean, it's science, but it's not really rocket science. I mean, this is about us as a, as a country taking a breath and not thinking about people as a patient or a beneficiary or a community as pockets of need. But these are our friends and neighbors and family, and we have to um, be willing to open our hearts and minds to understanding how all the resources that we have in this great country can come to bear move that line of that direction for life expectancy from going down to going up and eliminate the disparities in it across populations. Thank you very much.